Hello everyone and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. My name is Sava and today we are continuing our discussion of econometrics and in particular various diagnostic tests that we can use to detect assumption violations that lead to our OLS estimators being not of the best quality imaginable. In the past series of videos we have in relatively great detail tackled autocorrelation detection tests that can be used to identify the presence of autocorrelation in residuals that as per the Gauss-Markov theorem leads to our OLS estimators being biased. But there is an evil cousin of autocorrelation, another famous assumption violation issue that is relatively common and relatively present in both time series and cross-sectional regressions that is heteroscedasticity. When we apply the Gauss-Markov theorem to justify that our OLS estimators are the best linear unbiased estimators, uh, as per the catchy abbreviation BLUE, we also need to assume that the variance of the disturbances or the error terms or residuals, call them as you like, is constant. That is, the variance of the error term remains roughly the same throughout the whole sample, regardless of what might happen. If that's not the case, the estimators are inefficient. That is, the standard error of estimators can be higher than we might like, and that can lead to type 2 errors, when we would accept the null when a more refined methodology, a more refined calculation procedure for standard errors might have led us to rejecting the null and accepting the alternative. Without further ado, there is a lot of various tests that have been developed throughout the decades to detect various types of heteroscedasticity. Heteroscedasticity is not that much of a problem as autocorrelation is, but still it's really important to determine whether heteroscedasticity is present and if it is, to tweak your model accordingly to address this issue. And uh, unlike autocorrelation, that is quite intuitive to understand and the only difference in various autocorrelation structures would be lag length, to which extent you basically uh, extend your model and account for a different number of lags, heteroscedasticity can take many forms. And that's what we will evidence throughout this series of videos. First, let's consider the simplest and perhaps one of the most famous tests for heteroscedasticity, that is the Bruch-Pagan test. To apply it, first, let's just estimate a simple multiple linear regression. Here we've got the daily returns of the Tesla stock over the five-year period, as well as two potential explanatory independent variables that is, the returns of crude oil and the returns of the relevant benchmark S&P 500. Then we just need to estimate the OLS regression with those two regressors, independent variables, using the Linus function, and that's exactly what we're going to do now. So we need to select a 3 by 5 array, apply the Linus function for linear estimation, select the array of Tesla returns, our Ys, our dependent variables, and our independent variables, that is, those two arrays of oil and S&P returns, respectively. Then we establish that we need to calculate the constant, that would be our alpha in this model, and we need the Linus function to report additional statistics as well. And then we enforce this formula using shift control enter as it is a matrix multiplication formula. So shift control enter and we get our model output. Now, what we need to do is we need to calculate the expected returns, the expected regressed values of y, so that then we can calculate the residuals and proceed to the heteroscedasticity tests. Well, to calculate the expected value of the return of the Tesla stock, we need to consider the coefficients we've got here. First, we get alpha and we we'll lock the row because we don't want alpha to change estimation uh, to estimation. Then we need to add the oil beta of Tesla and lock the row here as well and multiply it by the respective oil return at a particular day. And then we need to finally add the S&P 500 beta, that is the main 
equity beta of our stock and multiply it by the respective S&P 500 return uh, to get the overall expected return of Tesla. And now to just simplify uh, dragging this formula down, we can just place a one over here and do the following procedure. We can click shift control down and it will select the whole array and then we can press control down to fill the whole array with expected return values. Then having calculated the expected returns, we can calculate the residuals, the error terms, the abnormal returns in the finance terminology. Those would be just the differences between the actual realized returns and the expected returns. So we then calculate the residuals for every single observation for every single trading day. Uh, and if we would be concerned with autocorrelation, we would proceed to the testing with actual values of residuals, but we are concerned with heteroscedasticity, that is the behavior of the variance of the error term or the residual or the abnormal return. So most of the tests we will encounter are gonna deal with the squared residual, so the volatility of the disturbance term, of the error term, of the abnormal return. So we just square the respective residuals and fill the whole array with those. And now we finally can apply the bruch pagan test. bruch pagan test is relatively simple to understand in terms of its concept. The concept of the bruch pagan test is that we try to relate the variance of the error term to our initial regresses. We try to establish whether there is a linear relationship between the value of a particular regressor and the volatility of our dependent variable. First, the limitation, the most obvious limitation of the bruch pagan test is evident. That is, if the relationship between the regressors and the variance is present, but it's non-linear, or it has another functional form, then the test would be imperfect. It would be underperforming in that case. But still, uh, to investigate uh, whether some simple linear heteroscedasticity is present in the data, the bruch pagan test is extremely useful. To apply it, we need again to select a 3 by 5 array for the lioness function, but here our dependent variable would be the squared residual. We tried to relate the volatility of the error term to the initial regresses, and then as our independent variables, as our regresses, we need to select the two regresses we are already familiar with, that is oil return and S&P 500 return. So we select those two arrays. We need to report the constants, so we put one here, and we need to report the additional statistics, so one here as well, and enforce it with shift control enter again, and we've got our regression output for the bruch pagan test. This output is also called the auxiliary regression, as it's an additional regression model that we apply just to identify whether heteroscedasticity is present. Then there are two ways to approach the bruch pagan test output in terms of hypothesis testing. And uh, those two are pretty familiar if you watched the autocorrelation test videos. First, we can just apply the F-test to figure out whether the whole model that relates the variance of the error term to two initial regresses is successful in uh, explaining this variance, so whether the model has sufficient explanatory power. And to do that, an ordinary F-test would suffice. So. To calculate the F stat, you can just divide the R squared that's reported again uh, on the left-hand side of the third row of the line of output, divided by one minus R squared, multiply by the number of the degrees of freedom, and divide by the number of explanatory variables, two in our case. And we get 0 0.3546. And just to remind you, F stat is actually reported in the line of output as well. In, on the left-hand side of the fourth row. And then we need to convert this F stat to a p-value, and that's easy to implement using F dist right-tailed function. As our x, we input our F stat. The first degrees of freedom parameter is the number of regressors, so two. And the second one is the number of the degrees of freedom in the estimation, so 1,255. We close the bracket, and we get the p-value of 70% way above the usual uh, critical thresholds of 5% or 10%. So it means that the probability 
that there is heteroscedasticity in the data, at least in terms of the linear relationship between the variance of the error term and the initial regressors, is 30%. So it means that it's very unlikely that there is indeed heteroscedasticity in our data. The second testing framework for uh, heteroscedasticity is the chi-squared stat and chi-squared test. Again, the chi-squared stat would be just the r-squared multiplied by the total number of observations, that is 1,258. And then we can apply the uh, chi-squared right-tail distribution, inputting the statistic that we have just obtained, and the number of the degrees of freedom would be the number of explanatory variables. In that case, it's two. And we get a p-value that is really close to the f-test p-value, and it reinforces our initial finding that the probability that there is heteroscedasticity is uh, lower than 30%, uh, and it means that the bruch pagan test does not allow us to determine that heteroscedasticity is indeed present. Uh, however, the multiple limitations of bruch pagan test um, evidence that it's not the only way to approach heteroscedasticity, and we will indeed cover many more tests in future videos on the topic. I will proceed to uh, less parameter-reliant tests like the Goldfield quant test, uh, some tests that investigate a different functional form that determines the variance of error terms, and we will also consider a whole another concept of heteroscedasticity that is prominent in time series research, that is ARSH effects and conditional heteroscedasticity tests. As for now, that's all for the bruch pagan test. Please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, please identify any future topics on business economics or finance you want me to make videos on, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.